In this episode, I spoke to astronomer and writer Tom Kers to discuss the secrets of the glowing green northern lights known as the Aurora Borealis and how you can see the phenomena for yourself. Well, hello, my name's Tom, uh, Tom Kers. I'm an astronomer and uh, an author. Um, and I'm not really sure what other titles I can give myself because when you go freelance, you sort of don't have a title. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I formerly worked at the Royal Observatory in London, here in Greenwich, where I live. Um, I worked there for almost seven years. And a couple of years ago, with very poor timing with respect to what's happened, I decided to go freelance and um, write more books and do some more interesting things. So at the moment, I fill my time with a mixture of writing books, with uh, podcasting, with um, consultancy for brands and um, events and things that are connected to, but sometimes just leaning on the aesthetic of astronomy, um, and many of which are all hushed-hushed and NDA'd, which is exciting. Um, and also just getting out there and stargazing, doing astrophotography, um, and, you know, enjoying the hobby as we all do. Yeah, well, um, indeed. Thanks very much for uh, coming on the podcast today, Tom. And, you know, as, as you said, you you do cover a lot with your podcast and your books, you know, sort of deep sky observing and, and stargazing. But um, today we're sort of getting quite specific. We're, we're going to be talking about uh, the Northern Lights and the Aurora because, um, well, our, our paths have really crossed because of your your uh, latest book, which is um, the uh, the Northern Lights, The Definitive Guide, which is all about uh, the Aurora. Um I just wanted to sort of kick off the podcast, just in case anyone's sort of unaware or um, isn't really too sure of what the Northern Lights or the Aurora are. If you could just uh, give us a bit of a description, um, what what are they, and and uh, how how is the phenomena caused? Well, I'm glad you're asking how it's caused because whenever talking about what the Northern Lights are it seems easiest to lean on the technical aspects because trying to describe it the, as an experience, it, words often fail um, to get it there. Anyone who's tuning in, who's seen the aurora themselves will know that it is truly out of this world, absolutely magical and really unique and hard to describe to your friends and family after you see it. But the Northern Lights, put simply, is a meteorological phenomenon, something that happens in our atmosphere, but with an astrophysical origin. So it doesn't really fall into um, a space. It's not really something in space, nor is it really weather. It's kind of a combination of the two. It's something we call space weather. And it's quite simply a display of light in the sky that reflects something about the environment around the Earth, specifically the magnetic environment, which is in a constant state of flux as the Earth's magnetic field interacts with the Sun's magnetic field. So the Sun's magnetic field is actually propagated out with charged particles known as the solar wind, particles like uh, single protons, for example, and electrons that flow away from the Sun, uh, not at the speed of light, somewhat slower than that, but still at a very high speed, and eventually reach us here on the Earth, where they smash into the Earth's magnetic field, causing all sorts of destabilization. But the Earth's magnetic field also acts like a net to some of these particles. It catches them. And then being that the magnetic field has two poles, a North Pole and a South Pole, where it's naturally strongest, the particles are focused down near the magnetic poles where they smash into gas atoms in our atmosphere and give those gas atoms energy. And atoms are kind of lazy. If you give them energy to hold on to, they sort of store it in their electrons for a bit, and then they want to they want to put it down. They don't like holding on to it. They're anxious. So the electrons release the energy after a period of time, and it's released as light. And some of that light we can't see, but much of it we can. And so we see this beautiful, visible display of color in the sky that dances around as the Earth's magnetic field is undulating with this flow of energy, this flux of particles from the sun. Yeah, it's uh, quite something to behold. I mean, you've um, mentioned that it's um, it's colourful, but you you haven't actually sort of landed on the colour green because I think that's the colour that most people think of when they think of the aurora. But it, it doesn't have to be green, does it? They get all these sorts of um, yellow hues and, and pinks, and uh, what actually causes all all the different colours? That's a a really good question, and it's something we can all tune into. If you think back to a time before time now, the 1980s, a brilliant time, a great time to be born, if I do say so myself, um, or to have lived through. You'll know that on most TV programs, when they wanted to make things look futuristic, they would use a plasma ball, the coolest item you could get into your home. And um, the way a plasma ball works, if you, if you think about what's inside it, you've got a ball of gas. Uh, this is inert gas. So typically you'd have gases like neon and argon. And then in the middle is something called an electrode, which just produces a current that flows out through the gas. And if you 
make a circuit with your finger on the edge of the ball, you can make the flow of current stronger. And so the gas atoms are being given electrical energy. They're being excited, it's a technical term, and then they're releasing that energy as light. And in the case of neon, you get a sort of pinkish glow. And in the case of argon, you get blue. So you get these two colors together in the plasma ball. And as you said, green is the color we associate with the auroras. And that's because green is released by oxygen, particularly molecular oxygen, the kind of oxygen that we breathe, which is closer, a bit closer to the ground, uh, where the atmosphere is a bit thicker and heavier. And there is an abundance of oxygen in our atmosphere, not the most abundant element, but oxygen atoms are big. So there's a big chance that these electrons coming in are going to slam into them and we're going to see a nice br uh, green glow. And that is the color most associated with auroras. But as you say, you can have lots of different colors. You typically will get pinks with your greens. Pinks are generally associated with molecular nitrogen. And you also get blues and sometimes reds as well. And while the blues are typically relate, uh, related to nitrogen, the red, which is can be very high altitude, up to sort of 600 kilometers or so above the ground, that is often associated with atomic oxygen. That's very rarefied gas in the upper atmosphere, um, but that's a rare sight. And if you're lucky enough to see scarlet red auroras, you know you've witnessed a, a brilliant display. Of <laughs> course, I think it's important just to pause and think about how color works, because we do see color well with our eyes during the day. But as all stargazers know, the color of the night sky seems quite muted. And it's not because it's not there. It's just because our, our eyes fail to be sensitive to it. And likewise with the auroras, the beautiful photographs like the, the one that's on the cover of my book uh, have a tendency to, um, to over-egg the visual experience. Because while the cameras capture the auroras with very unbiased color, to our eyes, they do appear less vibrant, which is not to say they're not colorful. It's just the color is subtle. It's more something you experience individually than, than, uh, than perhaps really looks the way that you expect it to look. That said, I've been lucky enough to see pretty much all the colors on offer. And as you say, you can get you can even get like violets and sometimes even yellow. And this occurs just because of the mixing of different colors being received by your eyes. So you can have an almost full visible spectrum of color uh, during a really impressive display. <laughs> You're obviously really, really um, uh, passionate about uh, the aurora and, and, and really interested in the science and, and the wonder. When when did you first see your, uh, or when did you see your first auroral display? Well, I know I don't sound it, but um, by heritage, I'm actually I'm actually a Scotsman myself. <laughs> it doesn't seem that way, but it's it's the clues <laughs> in the surname. And uh, my father's side of the family uh, go back in the Victorian era to uh, river keepers in the Highlands. I actually grew up for a part of my young life in a sort of unconnected fashion in um, the north of Inverness. And on the coast there, you can sometimes see the northern lights. Uh, in fact, increasingly so with the number of alert systems. It's easier than ever, I think, for people to see it. And I just have a vague memory of when I was a kid seeing the northern lights from the beach. I also remember my dad, who was a pilot serving in the RAF, would tell me stories about how when they took the, the Jaguars, that were the jets he was flying at the time, up over the, the North Sea uh, with the panoramic cockpit, it was possible to have the auroras above you. And you can kind of imagine in the mind of a child, that is almost mythology, something like that. It, it really lingers. So even at a young age, I think subconsciously, I made a promise to myself that one day I would see the Northern Lights for real. And uh, it's now over a decade ago, I got to go out to Iceland for the first time and have a really wonderful um, experience. Very lucky, actually, to see a, a geomagnetic storm, a really great display of auroras on my first time. Um, so, yeah, it's it's been uh, over 10 years now. But yes, it does. it's something that comes from childhood, which I think is true for most of us, really, with our lifelong love of the sky. Yeah, I mean, do you think that that was perhaps your your first um, astronomy experience? Would, would, would that maybe be the experience that um, sent you on your way to, to becoming a professional astronomer? Yes, I think that um, for many of us, it is those sort of like childhood memories that uh, they're not, some of them aren't even memories, but they really create some subconscious love for the sky. And I do sometimes wonder where my love for the sky came from, but I think I was really lucky to um, have grown up, as I said before, the son of a pilot uh, who himself, he decided he wanted to fly having watched people stand on the moon when he was young. Um, so that inspiration was passed down 
through the generations and I kind of caught his infectious love for space. And in the education world, which I've had some experience in, we have a great term for it. It's called science capital. And it really just means if your parents sort of take an interest in your learning, maybe take you to museums or um, share their love of science with you, it can be very, very infectious on young minds. And so I think I just picked up a love of space and that translated to getting my first telescope as a kid. And um, like many of us, just kind of falling very, very quickly in love with the sky when I realized that it was like a frontier of discovery and every single experience was brand new every time. You know, you really feel like Galileo when you point your telescope at Jupiter for the first time. Everybody gets to experience it. And I love that about it. Completely. Um, so what about today? Do you, do you, do you get much chance to um, go up to sort of um, Scandinavia and the sort of northern climes re- regularly enough to, to catch a display? Can we go back and take this interview in 2019? Because I've got a very good answer for you in 2019. But today, (laughs) regular (laughs) would be uh, a strong word. Um, The answer is uh, as much as I can, absolutely. And um, I've been extremely fortunate in my life to to be able to travel, uh, to see the skies in some wonderful locations like Namibia, Hawaii, Chile, Um, And of course, Iceland, which I've been to many times, more than a dozen times. I've actually spent now, I think, about 60 to 70 clear nights under the auroras in Iceland uh, in the past decade or so, um, which which really helped to inform how the book came together. Um, But yes, I I have every ambition of doing more in the future. Um, I'm very passionate as well about getting back up to Scotland where my roots are, because the sky there, when it's not raining, (laughs) is absolutely beautiful. It's, It's unrivaled in the UK for sure. And um, it's no accident that there's a dark sky uh, reserve up there. So um, that's something I would love to do more in the future, especially with kind of being a bit more conscious of the impact that travel can have as well on the climate um, to make the most of these, the skies that we have here on our own, in our own lands. Definitely. What, what was that, that um, story you told me um, a while ago and it was, you were, you were so captivated by uh, an aural display and you were looking up and you weren't watching, you weren't watching where you were, where you were going. <laughs> Oh, gosh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. The first time I went to Iceland to see the Northern Lights, um, I went on a, a bus trip, as many people do. And the, the bus trips are great because they will get you out to good sites to view. But there are some disadvantages, like being there with 300 other people, many of whom are trying to take flash photos of the sky, and you're sort of thinking, what are you what are you trying to light up with your flash? The universe? I don't think it's going to work. Um, and that's a bit distracting. So I think I must have wandered away from the group to get some peace and quiet. And yeah, I was very drawn to the sky. The aurora is a very arresting phenomenon. You've got to be careful. I wasn't careful. So I walked forward looking up and put my foot into a frozen stream right through the ice. <laughs> that was really cold. Um, so that brought me back to earth pretty quickly. But uh, But I was quickly absorbed again in the sky as my foot warmed up and dried off. Um, Yes, the terrain of Scandinavia and some of the other places that people will go, like Siberia or Canada, to observe the Northern Lights is actually, I think, part of the experience, is part of the adventure, because it's such another world to be standing on. And combined with this sky that is so unfamiliar, um, it is like being on another planet uh, or some sort of magical kingdom. Um, So, yes, be careful. Learn from my experience. Uh, just watch where you're walking when you see the lights for the first time. <laughs> That's my advice. <laughs> yeah, and there's a there, there's a reference um, that you make in in the book also to um, well, it's a <clears throat> it's a reference to uh, R- Robert Scott's uh, diary um, because he 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 wrote about seeing. Um, the Northern Lights during his uh, his expedition to the Antarctic, didn't he? That's that's quite a piece of piece of history. How did you how did you come across that? It is, you're right. I've always had a fascination with polar explorers. I think since a young age, there there was just something about the adventure of trying to get to either the North Pole or the South Pole. And poor, ill-fated Captain Scott, of course, um, tried to get to the South Pole and, and but failed to get home uh, all the way back in, in 1912. And uh, earlier in the previous summer, but what would be winter for the Southern Hemisphere, uh, he was writing about the northern, uh, or rather, I should say, the southern lights, the aurora australis. I think we'll talk about the terms a bit later. Um, as he was standing on the Antarctic pack ice, and some of the words that he used, I think, come closer than almost anyone else to actually describing what it's like to see um, auroras or polar lights. He said that 
the phenomenon has infinite suggestion. Um, he said that it's wholly spiritual or divine signaling. He's trying to frame it in the language of his time, the language of mystic signs and portents. Basically, it's pure poetry, and this coming from a naturalist who was very much rooted in the natural world and trying to understand things from a scientific perspective. Um, but it sort of just shows how indescribable the phenomenon can be. Uh, so I don't know when I first came across um, Robert Falcon Scott's writing on the lights, but I had been reading his diaries many years ago, and it was probably around that time. And so um, that was actually the first sentence that went into the book is a quote from Robert Falcon Scott. And while it, of course, refers to the southern lights, um, the experience, the felt experience, I think is very much the same even here in the northern lights. So fortunately, we don't have to put ourselves in as much danger as um, Scott and his colleagues, but uh, we can still get the sense of adventure um, by making our own sort of Arctic expedition. Definitely, yeah. And, and then the uh, first sort of uh, section of the book does talk about um, ancient recorded observations of, of, of the aurora. Just how far back do we know that um, those observations go? We know that um, observations of the aurora must go back an, an exceptionally long way. Um, simply because even in relatively recent history, the past few hundred years, there have been multiple instances where the aurora was seen really, really far south, places like Hawaii uh, or, um, or even closer to the equator, like Timor in Indonesia, where Captain Cook would have seen them from the deck of the HMS Endeavour uh, in the 18th century. So it's certainly true that probably even before humans had migrated across most of the northern hemisphere, there were sightings of auroras, but how our um, very, very early ancestors would have framed that and contextualized that, we can only speculate, really. So we do seem to have a very early written record, uh, which is in an ancient Chinese myth um, about uh, a goddess um, who gave birth to two very important children in Chinese mythology. And it's supposed that she saw a light in the sky which was actually close to um, the plow, what we think of as the plow or the Big Dipper asterism, uh, but written up in Chinese star charts, a light which moved in a circle and was persistent and which you could see the stars through. So it probably wasn't a lightning storm, otherwise the stars wouldn't have been visible. So perhaps that's one of the earliest examples dating back um, several thousand years to writing up a sighting of the Northern Lights, albeit in a mythological uh, story, a supernatural story, as we would call it. But more recently, coming into the last uh, few thousand years, so coming into a few hundred years before the Common Era, there certainly were recorded sightings of the lights made in in, uh, in Greece, for example, uh, earlier than that in Mesopotamia. And um, we can rely on those records because really they were um, stargazers and what we would consider early astronomers writing them down. Uh, but the actual earliest depictions of the lights may be far older than that. We think that early European uh, settlers or early modern European uh, proto-settlers may have depicted the lights in cave paintings, which could date up to tens of thousands of years ago. But it really is difficult to know if that's the case. Um, and so at the beginning of the book, I do talk about the very early history. But for the time being, it does remain very speculative. It only really starts to become clearer when we enter the age of Greek philosophy, where at that time, certain philosophers who either heard about the Northern Lights or witnessed them themselves, something that might have happened a couple of times a century if they were very lucky, um, started to speculate on what they might be. But in those days, even in Greece, there was some real, real disparity of, of understanding about who lived under the Northern Lights. They had their own opinions on what Scandinavians might be like. They called them the Hyperboreans, the people of the far north. And uh, they had strange myths about them as well. So the Northern Lights have been around um, and have been in the history of natural thought just as long as uh, many other things in the in the world, like volcanoes or lightning or wind or the stars. Uh, but the ability to study them has been so much more difficult until the last few centuries when people could actually get out there um, and start to record them and even photograph them in the past 150 years or so. Yeah. I mean, throughout their history, do we know at what point they begin being called either the Northern Lights or the Aurora? That's a really good question because uh, I think if you've heard the terms Northern Lights and Aurora Borealis, you could be forgiven for thinking that Aurora Borealis is an ancient term. Uh, 
uh, because it sounds ancient. It's written in Latin. It sounds fancy. But aurora borealis is actually a relatively modern term, and the very first usage is credited to none other than the well, astronomer Galileo Galilei in the year 1616. And he appears uh, to be then, describing then, probably you know, a second-hand account of uh, a sighting of the Northern Lights that may have come from one of his contemporary colleagues. We're not sure if he saw them himself yet at that time. And so he created the term Aurora Borealis, which means uh, the dawn of the North. It's actually connected to two different um, sort of mythological figures. You might think of them as gods, but they're more like uh, representations of nature. So Aurora, the, dawn, the goddess of the dawn, and Boreas, the goddess of the, nor- uh, the god of the northern wind. And when you combine those together, it's really just the way that scientific nom- nomenclature was created at the time was to kind of use these uh, Latin and Greek references. So Aurora Borealis, modern term, few hundred years old, The much older term would be Northern Lights, which um, seems to date back at least to the 13th century when uh, settlers on Greenland, who would probably have come from Norway, would have written Old Norse documents. And there's a fascinating old text from that time, which refers to the simply the North Light, or they would call it the Nordrljus, which is very similar to the modern Icelandic. And, um, for example, in Danish, I, I'm half Danish myself, and in Denmark, it's just called Nordlus, which just means North Light. So the Scandinavian and Germanic Northern Light is actually the more ancient term, even though it sounds relatively basic for, for clear understanding. And then, yeah, Aurora Borealis is a scientific term, the dawn of the North. In the Southern Hemisphere, the comparative phenomenon is the Aurora Australis, the dawn of the South or the Southern Lights. That's so awesome, yeah. I mean, just the whole history of, um, you know, sort of humanity seeing these, this incredible glowing phenomena and then throughout the, throughout the sort of um, centuries trying to work out what they are and, and, and giving them names and trying to get to the, to the bottom of the, of the secret. It sort of um, takes us nicely up to, I suppose, maybe yes, to the more um, scientific approach of more modern observers. Um, how, how long did it take for humanity to, to properly nail down exactly what, what the aurora is? Yeah, if we go back to those Greek philosophers who started to make the first quasi-scientific descriptions, then we're really going from a period of around half a century before the Common Era, right up to really the 1800s. Maybe you could say in the 1700s, you had some pretty interesting scientific ideas, but it was really only in the 1800s with the advances made to the understanding of both electricity and magnetism and the ability to recreate certain um, natural phenomena in the laboratory that you see the Northern Lights beginning to be understood in their proper context. Although you did have some very interesting ideas proposed by people like Edmund Halley, it's just that at the time, models for the Earth were a little bit um, crude or a little bit primitive. And so trying to contextualize the Northern Lights as a space weather phenomenon was more difficult because the idea of the Earth in space and the big space environment outside of it was still in its infancy. Even Halley, for example, tried to contextualize the Northern Lights within his own model for the Earth, which was the hollow Earth model. So in his model, the lights are created by material that spews out of the Earth's surface somewhere and then races overhead along the magnetic field line. So he's sort of like half right, you know, but these ideas are being pieced together. Once you get into the late, um, the late 1800s, the sort of Victorian era, you've got that wonderful age of science and industry and engineering, and um, some great advances were made. And as the polar explorers began to um, visit these regions with advanced scientific instruments at the turn of the 20th century, going into the early 1900s, when people like Scott were around, you really start to see rapid progress, which kind of culminates with Christian Birkeland, who create, recreated auroras in the laboratory really for the first time with the famous Birkeland sphere experiment. And that was early in the 20th century. So we're also still in the age of discovery when it comes to the Northern Lights, because there are mysteries that are still being unpicked today. And what's wonderful is in some cases, it's citizen science. And in other cases, it's things that were thought to be just a myth. So one of my favorite active areas of research is into aurora noise, which has been fabled for a long time. I can think of at least a dozen accounts from people I know who've reported seeing it. Seems to be very common for those who go to Canada, for example, to see auroras. But it's also had a long history of being dismissed as a psychoacoustic phenomenon, just a case of seeing something overwhelming and then hearing something in your mind's ear, 
happening at the same time, a crackling sort of sound or a shuffling sort of sound. But actually, aurora noise is real and it's been recorded. And just in the last decade, there have been advances into understanding its origin, um, which is sort of due to static effects in the atmosphere, not too high above our heads. And then there's the phenomenon known as Steve, which is a very uh, boring name given to a rather extraordinary phenomenon, the strong thermal emission velocity enhancement, which was mislabeled as a proton aurora for a long time until NASA satellites discovered that it is actually formed in a way that's quite separate to what we think of as auroras. Um, It's higher up and it's much more energetic and it can happen at a different angle to the rest of the auroral display over in the east or the west instead of in the north. And so it turns out that this space weather environment is much deeper and more exciting and more interesting than we had perhaps even thought throughout most of the 20th century, and that now with the age of space exploration, there's probably a lot more to learn. Um, So while we do understand how auroras form, thankfully there are many unanswered questions, and if you're fascinated by auroras, there are whole careers ahead of you where you can not only go and look at them every night, but you can research them yourself and make some new discoveries. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a, a bound to be um, a lot of people listening to this podcast now who um, are definitely sort of uh, inspired and, and really interested in, in the phenomenon and probably want to see it them, themselves. I mean, that, that's definitely something worth um, touching upon, given, given your experience and expertise in observing the aurora. Like, what's, what, what advice would you give to people who, who want to go and see the Northern Lights? Is there a specific um, place or, 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 or time of year or, or even time of, time of night to, to go and see a good auroral display? The first advice I would get, give everyone is don't delay. If you want to see the Northern Lights, don't delay. Because there's a bit of a myth that you kind of need to go around the solar maximum activity when the solar cycle reaches its maximum. And while there are more opportunities to see auroras at that time, they never switch off. So you can go any year and you are going to have roughly even chances of seeing a good auroral display, especially if you Uh, learn a little bit about how to forecast them, a complete guide to which is featured in my book, by the way. I'm (laughs) legally obliged to say that. Um, But (laughs) if you uh, want to know when and where to go, the first thing to understand is where the auroral oval is visible throughout the year. And uh, you probably already have a list of destinations in your mind because of the, the common association between countries like Norway, northern Sweden, Iceland, Canada, Alaska, and the Northern Lights. You could go more remote, somewhere like Siberia, if you really want to challenge, but there's no need to go anywhere particularly uncomfortable because you can even fly to the beautiful city of Reykjavik, the capital of Iceland, uh, rent a car and drive for just about 30 minutes out of the city and be in a fantastic site for viewing the Northern Lights. The key is to go at the right time of year um, and then subsequently at the right time of night. So with the time of year, you want to be out there when it's not permanent sunlight, which is the case during the summer in the Arctic Circle. So you do need to be out there during the winter, but of course, the winter is harsh, it's very inclement, so kind of the beginning and the tail end of winter are ideal times to go. And really, for those of us who have four seasons, we're really talking about the autumn and the spring, Uh, but the early autumn and the early spring, ideally. See, it's around the equinoxes, like the next few weeks here in September, and then again in March next year, that there's a slight enhancement to the auroral displays. And because the equinoxes, September and March, are quite nice warm times of year, relatively speaking, they're very popular times to go. You could go in October and maybe February, but I would probably avoid November through to January because, again, it is very cold and typically kind of cloudy. So look at new moon dates in September and October or in February or March at your destination. You prefer to have the moon out of the sky to keep the sky darker. And then when you're there and you've identified a good safe site with a good clear view of the north, you want to head out at maybe local time around 10 o'clock and make sure you're ready to pull, maybe not an all-nighter, but to stay out until at least about 2 a.m. local time. Give yourself a few hours, have some warm beverages, sit in the car and warm up every now and then, whatever you need to do to make it comfortable for yourself. It's just I have so many stories of friends and colleagues saying they traveled in Lapland and they didn't see the Northern Lights. They were really disappointed. And I'm thinking, hang on, you can see the Northern Lights literally every night from Lapland at this time of year. What's going wrong? (laughs) And I would ask them, well, when are you going out? And they'd say, well, we stayed out till about 7.30 and then we went back in for dinner. And I think, no, 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 you got to go out later. You really do have to be out around local midnight, preferably into the early morning hours. Um, 
because that is when it is in def- it, it, always at its most spectacular for you. The reason being, quite simply, that the auroral oval is this, this big, as the name suggests, ring of auroral light that's permanently happening in the Earth's atmosphere. And what you're waiting for is for the Earth to turn around and to turn you under the r- darkest, deepest part of the auroral oval, the darkest sky and the deepest, brightest part of the oval. And that's basically opposite the sun. So for you, you want to be up around local solar midnight, which to be, you know, to be uh, respectful to time zones and so on, you should really give yourself a window between 10 and 2 a.m. just to make sure you cover it. So yes, that's my sort of golden ticket advice. Um, But you can also do forecasting. And if you're flexible, if you're able to travel, or if you live in Scotland and you've got wonderful access to the sky, then it's worth paying attention to when geomagnetic activity is higher, when the storm surges are coming from the sun in the solar wind, because then you're much more likely to see an active display. And if you get really into it, you can get into some quite in-depth forecasting where you can start to look into things like substorms, which happen on short time scales. For the book I've written, I've tried to keep things relatively basic because my guide is about getting you into aurora chasing and then you can take it further if you wish. Just trying to give you the push really and start you on a, on a journey like the one I've been on. Um, but uh, you really should just think ahead about, as I say, those times of year, then the times of night, and just picking a destination that suits you anywhere that the auroral oval can be found. So Iceland, Norway, Lapland, that's northern Finland and northern Sweden, and also over in Canada and Alaska are all wonderful destinations that are well within reach. If you live in Scotland, I'm very jealous, try and look from home in the coming season before even booking a trip, because if you're alert enough, there's a really good opportunity that you will see them, uh, you know, in the next couple of months. Fantastic. Well, uh, thanks very much for for coming on the podcast, Tom, and, and sharing your experience and expertise. I mean, what what more inspiration could anyone want than you know the the past half an hour or so of of uh, information and advice that you've given us? Um, it's been it's been great to speak to you. But thanks, you know, th- thanks again for coming on. Thanks so much, Ian. It's always a pleasure. As you know, I'm a big fan of radio astronomy, so it's really nice to be on to talk about this. And I hope to come back another time and uh, talk about something else. But I will leave you by simply saying that. Uh, Everybody should see the Northern Lights. I think it's uh, an amazing experience that is, as I say, completely indescribable, more so than any other phenomenon in the sky. Um, And to that end, I wish you all a very pleasant, warm, safe journey um, and very clear skies on your adventures. 